So now let me talk about the origins of crypto. So um, the key innovation was this idea of blockchain technology. And that innovation actually happened well before uh, Bitcoin was introduced. So Haber and Starnetta published a paper in the journal Cryptology in 1991 outlining the idea of blockchain. And the application in their paper was the timestamping of documents. So that paper um, kind of sat around for, for quite a while. Nothing really happened. But there was another idea that arose. And Adam Back in 2002 essentially invents this idea a proof of work. And we'll go into considerable detail as to what that is. So the idea is that at the time, there was a lot of junk um, email. It was a real plague. And the internet being a free a good basically encouraged uh, certain people to do uh, spamming. And the idea was that what about if we have a different system where you have to do a little bit of work? So you run a computer program before you send the email. And for, for most of us, this would be just no, no big deal. It would, uh, so instead of the email going in one second, take two seconds. So this, of course, had different implication if you're sending millions of emails. So instead of just pushing them out, you have to invest in all of this work. And um, this work basically would make it infeasible to do uh, the spamming. So a number of people uh, were uh, working on this. Uh, Fork and Noor, uh, also in 1992. Um, this was like a, a big problem. So these two ideas of doing some work before you actually uh, send the email, so effectively the email becomes costly, uh, a very low cost for one, but a high cost for millions. And this idea of a blockchain, which we'll explore in some, um, some detail in a few minutes. These ideas were joined in this famous white paper by Satoshi Nakamoto in 2008, and Bitcoin was introduced. And it's introduced uh, as a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. And it's interesting, we will talk uh, again about this throughout the course, that the original vision of Satoshi Nakamoto was that this would be a transaction a mechanism. Indeed, the very first uh, retail transaction with Bitcoin was that somebody spent, I think it was 10,000 Bitcoin for two pizzas. Okay, so, so that was the original vision. That vision has not obtained. Bitcoin has been very successful, but it's been more successful as a store of value or something that's useful for very large scale uh, transactions. Nevertheless, the idea was a great idea. And many people got energized with this idea and decided that this was the foundation that they could actually build upon. So um, what about the basic attributes here? So there were plenty of digital currency ideas in the 1980s. So it seemed inevitable that we would have a digital currency. But there was a big problem. And there were maybe a hundred of these companies and almost all of them failed. And the reason was really simple. That a digital currency is not that much different than, let's say, a, a digital photo, a, a digital video, digital music, 
you can make a perfect copy. So you can spend more than once. So the idea that Satoshi Nakamoto had eliminated the possibility of spending more than once using blockchain technology. This is the so-called double spend uh, problem. With blockchain technology, as we'll see, there's a record of all transactions. It's completely open. So if somebody is spending, you can check the blockchain record to see if they have the coin to actually spend. Okay, so it's easily verified. It's completely transparent and very, very fast. So this information is kept in this ledger and the ledger or blockchain is immutable. And that's really important too, because you don't want a uh, adversary going and changing history. So mutability means that once it goes into this ledger, it's there uh, forever. It's also distributed amongst many different computers. And I'll show you in a few minutes what that actually looks like. So it is a redundant technology where the same ledger that shows who's got what and all of the transactions, that is basically replicated on many different computers or as we call them in the network, nodes. And the original idea in the Bitcoin paper was algorithmic scarcity. So the total production of Bitcoin was capped at 21 million. Today we have approximately 18 million. And the last Bitcoins will be produced in the year 2140. So it's also the case that uh, this technology has got um, user sovereignty, which means that you decide. You're the person that decides if you spend. Nobody else can do it uh, for you. And the last aspect was portability. And we talked earlier about how difficult it is to, let's say, carry around gold in any size. It's also difficult to do a wire transfer. It goes from bank to bank to bank, especially international transfer. So this is a completely different idea. There's no physical transfer. In crypto, a transaction basically goes on to this blockchain record. And it is propagated throughout the entire network. Everybody's got the same ledger. And that's just how it works. So there's no physical transfer of anything, the record, this immutable record, says that you own the coin. And it doesn't matter where you are. And it's, uh, it's very fast and secure. So this is a great, uh, great idea. Um, so let's think about this versus uh, fiat uh, currency. So, and, I, and I've kind of mentioned this already that the U.S. currency has got a number of attributes, like um, the government's ability to tax you and you have to pay in U.S. dollars, the legal tender, as well as, as I mentioned, uh, incarceration if you don't pay your, uh, your taxes in U.S. dollars. Okay, so uh, it's also the case that economic conditions impact the value of the dollar. And of course, it's also possible that uh, the Federal Reserve could choose to inflate by printing excessive uh, amount of currency. Okay, so this is a, a completely fiat and crypto, very, very uh, different. So um, you've got scarcity that is hard coded into the algorithm. So it's unthinkable to, to even um, speculate about some agreement to raise the cap on the number of Bitcoin. So why would people vote for that that own Bitcoin? Because as soon as that happens, 
the value of what they're holding would go down. So there is no link with economic activity, but let's be careful uh, about that. So uh, it's, it's really clear that the main fiat currencies are linked to the state of the economy. And if you've got an algorithm like uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum, it's just not clear that there's theoretically any link. But nevertheless, given that Bitcoin is now uh, a risky uh, store of value, it is sensitive to uh, risky uh, events. So for example, in March 2020, when the stock market plunged because of the COVID-19 scare, Bitcoin dropped by 55%. When people became a little more comfortable that we'd uh, emerge from the crisis, the stock market went up and so did uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. So Bitcoin is important. It is the flagship. We will talk about Bitcoin in this course via um, something that's known as wrapped Bitcoin. That is something that is traded in the decentralized finance space um, in the Ethereum uh, blockchain. So Ethereum is founded uh, by Vitalik in 2015. It is a different technology than Bitcoin. So Bitcoin essentially allows you to transfer from one account to another account. Ethereum can do something else. It can run a small computer program. And this is known as a smart contract. So you can think of Ethereum as a distributed computational platform. So remember I said that in Bitcoin, all of the transactions are um, are preserved in every single copy of the Bitcoin blockchain on every single node. This is also true for the smart contracts. When that program runs on one node, it will run on all of the nodes. So again, this is redundant, but this is a very important feature of this network. Okay, so essentially with Bitcoin, you can interact with other, let's say, uh, accounts, other people or institutions with transfers. But in Ethereum, you can actually interact with a smart contract. So that's really special. And Ethereum is the backbone of decentralized finance because most of decentralized finance uses the smart contract uh, method. So we'll talk about um, uh, decentralized applications, which short form um, are dApps. So what is a dApp? So you're probably most familiar, familiar with just a regular uh, you know, app on your, uh, on your smartphone. And those apps are basically you interacting with uh, a centralized party. And um, that centralized party has got an incentive for, um, to provide the service to you. And it might be they push advertising, they learn about you, uh, and other things. So a decentralized app is an app that puts people together as peers. So you interact through um, a smart contract but there's no centralized institution. It's just an algorithm. Okay, so think of the smart contract as the algorithm. There's no board of directors. There's no headquarters necessarily. So it's a very powerful idea that allows for peer uh, to peer. So as I mentioned at the beginning, this is a technology that creates a competitive marketplace for financial dApps. And we will talk about the primitives in the second course that include exchange, lending, tokenization, as well as other things. The other thing that's interesting with these dApps is the network effect. Okay, so, um, there is a way 
that is very natural in decentralized finance of combining and recombining different DeFi products. And there's also in a way to offer incentives to get people uh, to actually use a particular uh, protocol. That's much different than what we're used to in traditional uh, finance. Okay, so this is the end of the, the first module. And the next thing that I wanna do is to talk about uh, the foundations of DeFi. I've talked briefly about blockchain. I'll go into much more detail. Cryptocurrency, smart contracts, Oracle, stablecoins, and decentralized applications.